Thank you, Simjan, for those very touching words. Honestly, I don't remember the particular event, uh, but praise God. Praise the Lord for uh, his merciful ways in our lives. Thank you so much. I want to thank Pastor Thomas, Dr. Thomas Matthew, and uh, the leadership of the church, Brother Johnson uh, and family, and all the rest who are engaged in team leadership in your church for giving me this uh, wonderful privilege of uh, ministering to you from afar. You know, last year I was supposed to. Um, take his Bible study there and uh, then my nephew's marriage came up and uh, because of the wedding arrangements and the young man's sincere desire that I must solemnize the wedding, I had to rush home earlier than expected. Um, that time I promised, I never thought that it will be the, the whole world will come to a standstill as we are now, we thought it'll, the normal will continue to be normal unless the Lord comes. So I promised that I will be very glad to um, engage with the church when I come back. And I must say I'm very, very grateful to the church leadership, which gave me permission to come and, and attend my nephew's wedding. Uh, it was, a, it was a very loving act on your part. Usually, uh, usually uh, our people see these as, very, as, as insults. <laughs> and it's very difficult to receive forgiveness from people. But thank you. And uh, I also uh, thank you for organizing this uh, Zoom Bible study series. I must say that uh, I think it's uh, after the ICPF camp in Atlanta that uh, Brother Johnson suggested uh, that uh, it may be good if we could, I could uh, spend some time in a Bible study or something. And I remember a meal uh, with Dr. Thomas Matthew, my dear friend. Uh, you know, we all grew up together in, in India once upon a time. Uh, so... Uh, we are kind of contemporaries. Um, so I think uh, that was the time when we fixed we'll have the Bible study series. But then all of a sudden it changed. But I want to thank you for uh, giving me this privilege. It's, uh, it's an affirmation. And I also want to thank the church because, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Simpson said, uh, I am responsible for various missions. One among them is the training of primarily North Indian leaders. We have, we have about 220 residents we had, of which about 70 to 80% in a given year are from uh, a raw Hindi belt. That means Hindi or a, a, a dialect of Hindi is their uh, mother tongue. Now, uh, so the ministry is supported by um, our ministries, uh, Principal A.V. Peter and myself, we travel in various places and uh, it's through the goodwill of uh, our friends uh, that the seminary is kept operational because our students are not able to pay fees. When I shared that this burden, uh, uh, the church came forward to support some students and I must say that I am immensely grateful for your kindness uh, in arranging support. Now, I'll be grateful if you can share the screen. Is it possible, Simjin? Uh, hello? Yes. Yes, Anup is trying to... Thank you very much. Thank you, Anup. I can see the screen now. It's uh, helpful. Um, what, where, what I plan to do is to uh, take... Uh, go along with a journey, in a journey with Jesus uh, towards Jerusalem. Now, if you, if you have noticed, I'm sure you would have at some time or the other, uh, there is a major turning point in 
in uh, Mark's gospel. Now, the turning point in Mark's gospel uh, comes in, uh, in a narration uh, in Caesarea Philippi. I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. Um, there, if Jesus with his disciples begins a journey from Caesarea Philippi and the journey will end. It's kind of a travelogue. Uh, but the focus is not in describing places, but it is, uh, it is, it is the, the, the thrust is on a series of teachings that Jesus gives to his disciples. Uh, so Mark has a, an intentionally structured uh, block of teaching and these teachings are all associated with some event or a question or, uh, or a doubt uh, or some real life scenario like a, like a dispute among the disciples or a discussion or a doubt or a fear, things like that. So they are, or someone else coming to question him. Now, this functions as a specific unit if you go over to the next slide, you'll, you'll find the road to Jerusalem. You know, it functions as a, a definite unit of teaching because uh, in the final arrangement, the, the, this, this unit of teaching begins with the healing of a blind person. It takes place in the in the fishing town of Bethsaida. We find this in chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. And in chapter 11, I hope you will have the freedom to flip your the pages of your Bible. In chapter 11, Jesus is on that final march from uh, Bethphage and Bethany he goes up the hill and that's called a triumphal entry and proceeds to with the cleansing of the temple, etc., etc. So, if the journey begins from Caesarea Philippi southwards, it's a focused journey. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 9 and verse 51 following, we have a similar narration. The narration says, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. It's like, you know, you know the direction, you know what lays ahead of you. Nothing is going to dissuade you. It's like Caesar has now, Julius Caesar has now decided to cross the Rubicon and march into Rome. And, and that will be seen as a political assault. It is something like that. I'm not saying that Mark is influenced by Caesar's uh, narrative. No, 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 no. I'm just comparing it. It's a major decision. You know, 30 years back, the BJP, uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, where it is now and where it was, uh, the, the, the president of the then BJP, Lal Krishna Adwani, decided on that symbolic historic Ratha Yatra. You know, with so much of TV footage and commotion and whatever happened along the way and a lot of pain and bloodshed uh, by December. You see, that was a decisive yatra or a journey. Or like Mahatma Gandhi uh, doing the salt march as a, a, a decisive march. Uh, Jesus makes this decisive march, purposive march, where his life's mission will emerge uh, or will reach its conclusion 
as he reaches Jerusalem. Now that kind of a focused journey, travel law, travel narrative, then becomes the, the background or the scenery or the setting of deep instructions on what it means to be a disciple. So it opens with uh, the entry to Caesarea Philippi uh, begins with uh, a healing miracle in Bethsaida and the entry to Jerusalem uh, is, is kind of preceded by the healing of blind Bartimai, blind Bartimai. Now there are two healing miracles. In ancient methods of storytelling, where there is, you know, when stories are recorded, when people wrote, there were no page numbers, uh, there was no paragraph break, there was no sentence structures, uh, there was no chapter division, and even words were not, you know, given the decent printers, readings, technique, or uh, a, a, a gap between two printed words. Now, that's the ancient way of writing. Now, with such constraints, these kinds of events function like highlighting, or you open the bracket and you close the bracket. So it starts with a healing, the healing of the blind man, and it ends with the uh, healing of uh, Bartimai, another blind man near Jericho, and then suddenly Jesus enters Jerusalem in chapter 11. So we find the journey, I've outlined the journey here. Uh, I'm sorry, I had a wonderful collection of maps uh, which I used <laughs> during my class sessions. Now, I don't know what happened, Oh, you have this map, wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. You have done this great job. I requested them to, to, to do this for me. Thank you so much. This journey uh, is shown and uh, I will uh, see it goes all the way down. Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi. I'll explain it tomorrow. And from there, he comes into Galilee. He passes via Capernaum. That is the place where he was stationed during his public ministry. If you look at Luke's gospel, chapter 4, Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. And from Nazareth, therefore, he shifts his operational base to Capernaum, where Peter uh, probably stays. His mother-in-law had a house. And then they come into Judea. And through Judea, uh, the journey is described. And then they pass through Jericho. Uh, to Jerusalem in chapter 10, verse 52. Now, that's the journey section. Thank you so much. I appreciate this. Uh, my maps got corrupted. And yesterday when I tried to download them, uh, revive them, you, you know it's not very easy. <clears throat> uh, they think as if I did not purchase the module. For, we'll forgive them for that. Now, this journey... Uh, motif or a, a literary method of uh, showing a significant the significance of a movement which is charged with purpose. Now that journey motif has later emerged as the as a, a way of identifying Christianity. If you look at Look at Luke's gospel. Uh, it's, it, the way has become a name for early Christianity. The word Christian uh, became, uh, came into usage in Antioch where it was a nickname given. Now, Jesus gave nicknames to his close associates. Uh, Simon was called Ke Kepa, means the rock. He was anything but a rock. He was only kind of a sinking sand. Uh, though he makes bold statements, he usually, you know, is like us. Uh, he he called, uh, you know, the he, he, the sons of Zebedee were called Bo and Erges. Uh, so they had a nickname. 
So Christianity, word Christian is a nickname given uh, as kind of a derogatory way of addressing the Messiah followers. But the dignified way at that stage seems to have been to referring to to refer to Christianity as the way, as I have listed in Acts 9, 18, 19, uh, twice, chapter 22, chapter 24. Uh, it's called the way of Jesus. I wish this had remained like this because the journey motif, the necessity to progress from the start point to the finish point, that the way has definitions, it's, it's got markers, that the way is Jesus himself, as uh, John's gospel tells us. Now, these things would have been much, much clearer. Uh, the way of service, the way of humility, the way of sacrificial love, the agape root, uh, this would have been really, really uh, ingrained into our own uh, Christian understanding and therefore would have shaped our behavior uh, rather than uh, the word believer. I'm not saying that's not important. It's there. We'll see the, the importance of faith. But, you know, just three days back, a senior pastor of a respectable denomination, uh, we were friends, he called me and said, Brother Edie, you have a minute. I said, look, I have lots of time for you. And he said, look, as I am studying, I have been in ministry for almost 22 years as a pastor of this particular denomination till God uh, gave me this new assignment. Uh, he is a very influential person, very informed, influential, uh, hilarious preacher. Uh, he said, I have discovered that the Lord Jesus Christ had a lot of emphasis on our loving him, that's God, and loving our neighbor. He would rather have defined Christianity as the way of love. He said, can I preach? I said, Pastor, you have finally heard the Holy Spirit speak to you. Finally, heard the Holy Spirit speak to you. Praise God. Praise God. At this stage, your ears are beginning to function. Now, why I said this is, you know, with our normal ways of defining what it means to be a Christian, we tend to emphasize certain aspects at the expense of others. One such being that Christianity is a way or we follow Jesus, that it's kind of a pilgrimage. We have a leader who has shown us a pattern and the journey is authentic when we walk all the way with Jesus. Now, let's proceed to the next slide. Now, with this in mind, what I intend to do during these sessions. Brother, can you please advance the slide? I can't do it from here. Uh, with these uh, in, uh, instructions, yes, we are right, we are right, thank you. Um, with these instructions, uh, in introductory observations, uh, I, let me show you again what happens in this journey section. Uh, there are actually, in between chapters 8 to 10, there are actually five miracles. I think the greatest miracle is, is in chapter 9, that is uh, verses 2 to 12, the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, we will look at it uh, tomorrow. Now, it begins with chapter 8, begins with the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, we, had, we are not starting from there for want of time. We could have actually looked at, looked at the whole section a little bit more differently. Uh, if we had the other informative miracles uh, which help us unlock the, the, uh, the, the rest of the teachings. So the feeding of the 4,000, 
And now to even look at this uh, next one, that is the man at Bethsaida, a restoration of vision in two stages. It's followed by, uh, you know, Jesus is teaching uh, about who he is and discipleship, verses 27 to uh, the end of chapter 8. The next miracle after this healing is transfiguration. And as they come down from the mountain of transfiguration, we have the incident of uh, the healing of a boy with an impure spirit. Now, that, that casting out of a demon is very, very important here because the disciples are unable to, and finally there is a, a reprimand there. He, 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 he says, where is your faith? How long shall I suffer you? And then, of course, Jesus casts out. The, there's a dialogue with the boy's parent. And then, of course, it's all teaching. And as I said, it ends with the healing of blind Bartimae in chapter 10, verses 46 to 42. Now, the two vision corrections, as, as we saw earlier, bracket or hold within these two uh, a lot of clarifications on what it means to follow Jesus. What is kingdom lifestyle? Yes, we'll be, uh, our attempt will be to learn along the journey what it means to be uh, a subject of the kingdom in which Jesus is the king. Let's go to the next slide. So today we will we'll look at the first healing miracle. It takes place in Bethsaida. Now, where is it? The location of Bethsaida is slightly debated. We are not too very sure. But scholars say it is towards the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it is one of the Greek cities, uh, other than, uh, you know, which means uh, it's a fishing center. And majority of the population here are, are non-Jews. Uh, it is in this place Jesus has gone uh, along some non-Jewish settlements and he has gone and if you look at chapter 7 he goes to Tyre and Sidon that is where the, uh, the lady the, 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 the Gentile lady's uh, daughter is healed and so it's all in a movement. It's not a straight line. It's kind of crisscrossing or roundabouts uh, where Jesus takes the initiative to visit. And here people come to him uh, with a blind person uh, who probably uh, could see and lost his sight by some reason or the other. Because he can describe in uh, along the uh, healing miracle, how he sees human beings. So that is all uh, strange. Uh, that is because he probably was sighted. He lost his sight, unlike the person in John's Gospel, chapter 9, who was born blind. Now, this is a blind man anyway, like most of us, several of us. We are born with perfect vision, but along the journey, we have challenges. But the significance of this particular healing miracle, what I really want to highlight is that it, the healing happens in stages. No, no other miracle of Jesus has this kind of a delay. If Jesus says, things happen. He tells the sick child, Talitha Kumi, she just stands up, sits up. She, he will touch the widow of nine uh, son's corpse and he will come to life. If he tells a corpse, uh, a dead body, Lazarus come out, there is no delay. The raging sea and the frightening storm. If Jesus tells, shut up, be quiet. It's like, you know, into a messy, noisy classroom, the, the teacher goes and gives a tap on the table and says, be quiet. And, you know, the whole class comes to pin drop silence. So he could still the storm and calm the sea 
raise the dead, cleanse the leper, you know, uh, make a paralytic walk. You know, usually after you get into a cast for 30 days, 45 days, you go through uh, a series of physiotherapy to make your muscles uh, functional. Now here is paralysis, uh, a nervous condition uh, heal where the, the bone system and the muscular system, they are all coordinated. He just lifts up his own mat and walks, mattress and walks. All these, all the miracles of Jesus, they do not usually go through a formula like, uh, like what magicians did. He would touch, there are instances of using spittle and the mud and all, that's there. But you know, there are times when Jesus has prayed, uh, he takes the bread and gives thanks, or at the tomb of Lazarus, or it's just a command. Command. Now, in this story, the, the healing takes place in stages. You know, Jesus takes the man out of the village in verse 23 and spat on his eyes and laid his hand on him. Uh, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees. People looking like trees. That's verse 24. And then there's a second intrusion. Again, Jesus lays hands on his eyes and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. That restoration and look at the next word he saw everything clearly now this progressive healing correction of vision when a person starts up as no sight and there is a powerful engagement intrusion from the side of the Lord uh, and there is a, a remarkable progression uh, you know you have a disease or something and you you go to a doctor who puts you on a course of medicines and he will say after five days after ten days we will have a review session I want to see how you make progress no, that's because the doctor has some kind of a knowledge, but he wants to be double sure whether the, 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 the treatment has to be adjusted or changed. Now, this person starts blind. They bring him blind to Jesus. Then he begins to see partially sighted. He sees human beings walking like trees. They are walking, but they look like trees. Now, that's the kind of uh, very poor vision that some of us have, and we get it corrected with, you know, all kinds of surgical intrusions or by wearing glasses. And then, of course, there is a final healing when he says his sight was restored. And the next phrase, he saw everything clearly. And Jesus commissions him. He sent him to his home. Do not enter the village because there is a secrecy uh, motive here. Why did he do it, do it? He fears that in Bethsaida, there is going to be such a commotion that his journey schedule is going to be affected. affected. If we look at the teaching from here till the healing of the blind party my it is this kind they from very primitive or inadequate understanding of who jesus is and what his message is and what it means to follow him the disciples progress. They go from inadequacy 
to various higher or clearer levels of perception clearer levels of perception so this correction or the vision the introductory healing miracle and the second stage in which this person is able to see again and he can see with clarity when he can see with clarity everything clearly is what the lord and the spirit want to happen in our own spiritual journey so much so that it should end with or similar to the story of the healing of blind bartimai please would you flip the pages and come to mark's gospel chapter 10 verses 46 to 52 we know the story of this uh, uh, bartimai bartimai you know he's a beggar and uh, you know beggars usually uh, you know they could not the braille was not there and they would not have learned much of a life skill trainings so their only option was to beg for mercy and israel was expected to provide for the needy well that 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 being the situation he is we look at verse 46 they came to jericho and as he was leaving jericho with his disciples in the great crowd barthimai barthimai his uh, only surname they know his own uh, uh, you know he, he, he is his name is lost own name is lost he was a beggar there are so many beggars how do you identify this one particular beggar oh his father's name is timai see that's the kind of insignificance that bartimai had his primary identity was that he was a beggar and the next is who which beggar he is the blind beggar which blind beggar of course mr timai's son bartimai and of course you know when bartimai sits there and begs he already has heard about jesus uh, and his and his ministry and his healing healing traditions and i wonder i would imagine like this how many times these people would have said if i see jesus i will regain my sight or if i can come across jesus now as the entourage progresses bartimai uh, expects probably a better collection but then he he finds out it is jesus of nazareth and bartimai begins to cry out the top of his voice in verse 47 jesus son of david have mercy on me jesus he is reprimanded by others but jesus stops and then there he enters into a conversation asks bartimai what does he want and then of course uh, his request is granted rabbi let me recover my sight jesus said to him go your way your faith has made you well this is the conclusion of it go your way your faith has healed you but bartimai instead of going home follows jesus and immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way one it starts with stages of healing and it closes with another perfect healing the two stage healing describes the world as well as the disciples in a journey bartimai is given clear vision and when he is able to see the way and choose a way bartimai chooses to follow jesus jesus becomes his way he attaches himself to jesus 
on the way, all the way to Jerusalem. Now you see how the two healing miracles uh, therefore have more than the gracious gift of vision restored, they have more than the, the, the blissful experiences of two blind people. They tell us much more about the healing we need, the corrections we need, and the way that is open to us. Can we proceed to the, to the next slide, please? Now, if we look at this, uh, this, this situation, which I've said, you'll find it's kind of the healings function as kind of keys to understand what happens in the rest of the conversations. Jan, if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 8, you know, this is following the, uh, the multiplication of the loaves and Jesus tells the disciples, be careful about the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod and they go into a terrible misunderstanding and they think, oh, he is correcting us because we have not packaged sufficient food for the, the next leg of the journey. So the uh, logistics team got it wrong. And then Jesus asked them a series of questions. Look at verse, verse 17. I have listed it. Do you still not see? Repeat it. Do you still not see? And the two healing miracles of vision correction. Verses 17 and 21. Do you not see and do you not understand? Have you not perceived? 817. Are your hearts hardened? And this theme of hardening of the hearts will be precisely picked up in Matthew 10, verse 5. 818, do you not hear? In chapter 7, before the free, uh, what is it? Uh, feeding, of the f feeding of the 4,000, there is a healing of a deaf man. You know, Jesus says, be open. And his ears are open. Look at verse 20, 35 of chapter 7. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Look at verse 31, 37. One of the most beautiful sentences in the Bible. He has done all things well. Taking us right back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, I believe. God, after creation, looks at all that he has created. And just like a painter has, or, a, or, a, or, or someone who makes sculptures, uh, you know, looks at the finished work and has that sense of satisfaction. That's good. It looks perfect. But that sense of uh, perfection is now brought into the healing of an individual. And people say he has done all things well. Do you not hear? When the deaf and the dumb are enabled to hear and speak, the disciples have a problem of hearing. Verse 18, do you not remember? Now, Dr. Thomas Matthew would have taught you one of the repetitive, repeated Charges in the Old Testament is this, remember, recall, remember what the Lord did. Recall the historic saving interventions of God. When God set you free, you were once slaves. God set you free, released you from bondage, from brick making to the freedom, the freedom of the children of God who worship the living God. Remember, remember. You know, we all have this problem of memory. 
do you not remember? And then in chapter 9, the question is repeated, where is your faith? You see, we have in between, uh, in, in, in the same thing, chapter 9, we have the story of the, the casting out of demons, where this issue of faith comes. Comes to, come to Jesus' uh, interaction with, with Peter. Be gone from me, Satan. Get behind me. Stand in line. Demon possession of a church? No, we'll, we'll unpack it as we uh, look at uh, the word in greater detail. Brothers and sisters, their vision challenges, their lack of understanding, their inability to hear, and they are being misguided by Satan. They are losing faith. And, and their hearts getting hardened. The, no, these are all picked up from the healing narratives. When Jesus invaded people's life or people were brought to him that Jesus would uh, influence them or touch them or, or correct them, deliver them. When that happens at a, a, on a physical level, the church represented by the inner circle, those closest to Jesus, still need the blessings of healing. Now, this kind of a need comes out clearly from the story of Israel. Would you please turn, uh, take me to the next slide? The, uh, the, yeah, thank you. Now, in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord uh, and is struck by the heavenly worship, you know, this is a time of major political upheavals. This is the year that King Uzziah has died. There is a major social, uh, political and economic uh, transition and international power equations are are going to be differently configured. There are tremors in, the, in, in, in international uh, relations. Uh, Isaiah is called and commissioned uh, to, to become the spokesperson. And he says, how long, Lord? And this mission is, you preach, you speak, you take the word. And the result is not repentance. The result is seeing, yet they do not see. Hearing, yet they do not understand. Their hearts are going to be hardened. The people will not respond. So blindness and deafness and the hardening of the heart is a sign of people refusing to the invitation of God. When John the Baptist invited the nation, repent as a herald of the, of the living God and the end times, he said, repent for God's kingdom is round the corner. A lot of people repented, but many didn't. Jesus comes uh, dancing with them, rejoicing with them, eating with them, uh, celebrating with them, uh, healing them. But they did not believe. And therefore, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, we, you know, in the story of the four types of soils, when they are being, that, that parable is being explained, this passage is used. 
Isaiah's mission is used. So blindness and deafness in the community of God, among the people of God, when it is uh, metaphorical or when it describes the state of the people of God, the spiritual state, when it describes more than a physical condition to uh, a, a spiritual state of existence, it's a sign of judgment. Contrast it with, again, Isaiah himself primarily, where healing, the deaf hearing, the mute speaking, and the blind seeing become powerful symbols of God's healing visitation. Isaiah 29, 18, we are very familiar with chapter 35, verses 5 to 6, 6 Isaiah 42, 7 and 16. Uh, and then, of course, you know, when the disciples of John, John was arrested and put in prison because he did what God asked him to do. And uh, then he sends his envoys to Jesus. And are you the coming one or do we wait for someone else? If you are the one to come, why am I behind bars? Jesus narrates his own healing miracles. Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind see, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the dead are raised. Good news is preached to the poor. Now, all these Isaiah passages I have listed here are combined by Jesus in his own self-defense, encouraging John to persevere to the end. Healing, the particular kinds that are types that are highlighted here, is a sign of the presence of the kingdom of God or salvation. Deafness and blindness as spiritual metaphors is a sign of judgment and deliverance from such physical as well as because it is pointers, it becomes metaphoric or the presence of salvation. In this context, let's look at the 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 this Mark eight six through a very specific verse which Isaiah gives us Isaiah forty two eighteen and nineteen and I've quoted it for you it's on your screens here you deaf look you blind and see and the next verse it's God's lament. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I sent? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me? Blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. When we read Jesus' uh, lament with his disciples, his heart's frustrated statements, do you not see, do you not understand, do you not hear, are your hearts hardened? Get behind me, Satan, where is your faith? It is within this Isaiah framework of God's kingdom being announced and revealed, people rejecting it, where God's invasive healing symbolizes the presence of God's kingship and the age of salvation. The lament comes. Who is blind? Who is deaf like my servant? my own messenger, the one who is in covenant with me. There is seeing, but there is no perception. They hear, but there is lack of understanding. Now, let's, let's, let's look at the last slide now. 
we'll come back to the story of blind Bartimai. The beggar prayed, Jesus, son of David, king, the promised king, Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, not only the announcer of God's kingdom like John the Baptist or the apostles, Jesus, the bringer of the kingdom, the bringer of the age of salvation, Jesus, God's anointed king of Israel, have mercy. When a blind man pleads for mercy, Jesus will stop the journey and attend to him. May these nights and devotions bring Zacchaeus, no, so not Zacchaeus, Bartimaeus into our own lives, our homes, and our community. May we lift up our hands to him in beggarly expectation and we cry out to him, Merciful King, show us mercy. We want to see. Now, as I explain this further, so I'll take your question soon. You see, Paul would use this blindness to describe the condition of the world. The world that refuses or has not come to Jesus or they have come or heard but they refuse to believe. And he would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, you know, comparing the, his own story of uh, coming to know Jesus. Uh, he was blinded in his heart. Then he becomes physically blinded by the vision of Jesus. And then, of course, when Ananias goes and prays over him, he receives his sight, his sight and he begins to see. The God of this age, so says Paul, has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers from seeing Jesus, the glorious face of God. Jesus, the image of God. Jesus, in whom all the fullness of God lives bodily. Jesus, the most authentic representation of who God is and what God wants to do. But that is it. The Gospel of John shows us another side. The true light that was coming into the world, that was Jesus. John was only a witness to the light. He was not a light, John 1, 9. But in conversation with Nicodemus, who comes to meet Jesus in darkness in the night, there is this comment. The true light that has come into the world attracts people. But some are so comfortable in darkness. These are like nocturnal animals, scorpions. They like to stay in darkness. When bright light comes, they would withdraw. They will go back. They will escape. They shun the light. John's Gospel says people who do evil, and the greatest evil, therefore, is a rejection of Jesus himself. Because their deeds are evil, they prefer darkness over against light. Look at Bartimai. The moment he was, his sight was restored, he chooses to follow Jesus. Look at the disciples as we look at them uh, or we, we, we feel them around tomorrow onwards. There is a kind of a comfort zone in seeing People walking like trees, our perceptions, our ideologies, our traditions. We don't want them to be shaken. We are so set and comfortable in the pit holes that we dig for ourselves. They are kind of bunkers within which we take refuge. People 
prefer darkness as a lifestyle less they come to the light they are exposed and they need to be corrected paul would reflect on this kind of a story of the partial healing in first corinthians 13 in a church community which thought that they had all wisdom and understanding they were not lacking in any spiritual gift and the all knowledge is given to them they are such spiritual people paul takes them to the humility of partial knowledge partial vision he says we see dimly in the ancient world people did not have mirrors of the type that we have they used polished metallic surfaces glass making was you know it's it's not as we have now they 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 were better at making porcelain uh, than in blowing glass so what what how did they see they did not have the support of the modern mirror so they saw their own images in water bodies especially you know where there is a a a, a bed which enables one to see a reflection of oneself or you know it's a reflection in a, in a, in a river i hope some of you can recall this uh, in in your some uh, holiday or somewhere you would have seen this uh, or, or at least paintings you would see now or they look at polished metallic surfaces that is the reflection but not a perfect reflection it's a dim reflection we see dimly as in a mirror we know in part we prophesy in part he takes the blown up understanding of the corinthian church and brings them to a a more uh honorable understanding you writing to the romans he will say do not think beyond what you need or to think you see bringing our self estimations to uh, a discipline of humility so blindness and partial sight uh, will have have uh, use in later gospel proclamations now when we uh, when we look at ourselves it will be good for us to progress in our faith if we had the humility of paul to say we do not know in perfect we know in part and we see as if in a mirror one of the major difficulties is the clash of perceptions now when we come to the gospel we bring a set of pre understandings shaped by our tradition our experiences our dreams or you know we are all uh, what is it uh, we are sons of the soil we are we are all impacted by the spirit of the age or the climate of opinion culture has a great impact on us now uh, we'll come to this later on so we are all uh, products of our time we live within our times sometimes this can have our own culture understandings and pre understandings the baggage that we inherit and we want to pass on may limit our vision of the gospel let me give you three stories ancient i'll summarize soon three stories ancient uh, philosophers had this story you know imagine somebody being uh, uh, imprisoned in a dark cave for a very very long time the person's eyes have become adjusted to darkness 
and suddenly they are uh, set free from this dungeon and brought into bright light. They can't see them. You see, even when we are asleep and we, when we wake up, if somebody shines the light into our eyes or there's a very bright light, you know, we are, we are you know, light sometimes darkens us. Our eyes needs time. From night vision to day vision, our, our, our vision equipment, our camera needs adjustments. Like the man in the dungeon comes out. He can't see. He is blinded by light. It will take time for him to see with clarity, with the benefit of, of light. You know, we, we have the Indian story, the Indian story of five blind men going to study an elephant. You know, there's an empirical research there. And these are their findings, the empirical report. What's an elephant? One fellow said, it's a long rope. Always swinging like a swing. Somebody else said, it's a, you know, an elephant is a big, big well, well set uh, pillar. Somebody said it's like a painting surface, a wall. The one who touched the belly, the one who touched the leg said it's a pillar. Somebody who touched the, touched the what is it, um, uh, ear said, oh, he is a constant fan. You know, elephant he, you know, is a fan. What's an elephant? It's neither the rope, it's neither the pillar, nor the wall, nor the fan. The Indian philosophers use this to show that claims of truth, even when it tallies with experience, are not perfect or absolute. The truth may be far different from our perceptions. That's how they use it. Sometimes they say, they say and use another story to say, our perceptions may be very, very unreal. Another story, they say, somebody sees a, a rope hanging from a distance or the shadow of a rope and a seer can come to this conclusion that there is a snake hanging from the shadow to the reality, from experience, perception to reality, from darkness to light, need for adjustment. What do these worldwide stories tell us? They appeal for humility to listen, to search, be willing to discard your perceptions and pet theories of the elephant. That is the challenge of discipleship. As we journey with Jesus in the, in the next days, we will see Jesus challenging us to throw away our faulty perceptions. Let us come to him like Bartimai and pray, Lord, have mercy. Speak to me. Let me hear, heal me. Let me see, heal me. Let me not be a servant who sees and yet does not see, who hears and yet does not understand. Let me not be someone who is led astray by evil and deceptive forces. Let me not be someone whose heart is hardened. Let me not be the easy, forgetting, forgetful ones. Help me understand and remember. Have mercy. Thank you. And if you have questions, I'm glad to take it. Thank you.